Good evening and welcome to this open forum. Tonight we're debating the end of democracy and the fact that so many of you have turned out to debate this gives me great faith that the democratic form is not dead. But still democracy is under serious challenge. <coughs> There are accusations being flung at democracy from all over the world. That democracy produces corrupt politicians who are incompetent. That democracy is failing to protect minorities. That even minorities in France and in the United Kingdom are feeling unsafe. That democracy is too short term. It's failing to deal with issues like climate change. That Democracy has become money politics, that the largest, wealthiest interests in any society can buy the outcome that they want. So those are the, those are the critiques of democracy. Why is it that people, including several of tonight's panel, have fought so hard for more dem democracy in their countries? They've fought with a vision that democracy is a form that enables any society, a so societies in which people don't agree, in which people don't like each other necessarily, have clashing interests, to elect, to be represented by lawmakers who make law in their name, to hold those lawmakers to account, to ensure there is a rule of law, and to ensure that minorities are protected. These are the values that underpin democracy. So we're very lucky tonight to be joined by such a formidable uh, group of scholars and politicians to reflect on what do they see the end of democracy and what are the things they really are trying to do in their own countries and in their own professions. And I'd like to begin by asking Mr. Ali Tahouni, who's president of the Libyan Constituent Assembly and was a leader of one of the political movements of the Arab Spring, to begin by telling us, is he disillusioned with the idea of democracy in Libya? Mr. Tahouni. Well, uh, thank you for uh, uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm not disillusioned uh, with the idea of democracy in Libya because we haven't really experienced democracy in Libya. Um, and the idea uh, that I think it's very important to uh, get through, uh, <clears throat> I for one fought for 40 years against Gaddafi regime. And I was lucky enough to be part of the Arab Spring and the Libyan Revolution. And I became part of the leadership. I was Minister of Finance and Oil and Deputy Prime Minister and finally Acting Prime Minister. And now I'm elected to uh, uh, part of the CDA, uh, that's the Constitution Drafting Assembly. And I'm also now the president of, of, of that uh, body that is writing the Constitution for the future. But the point that to get through is uh, <clears throat> the failure of democracy in many ways is a separation of the political process from the economic developments, or at least that's a key element in it. We in the Arab Spring, we went from the uh, side of anger uh, against the regimes that existed for so long, these undemocratic regimes. And that anger and that motivation to destroy the old regimes was the right one, was the correct one. But I think the failure of the Arab Spring, the failure uh, of the leadership, is that we really had no clear idea about the alternative uh, to the old regime that we destroyed. Even though uh, uh, these regimes are based on a very strong ruler, uh, ruler and a very weak institutions, but that's really not an excuse. Uh, so the key element, I think, that, uh, that we always need to think about is that in the strive for that change, we really have to be very thoughtful about what is it that we're destroying, which is a lot of times clear, but what is it that we are really uh, bringing that is at least marginally better than what existed before? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. Can I, can I move to the man on your left, Wang Hui, professor at Tsinghua University, but a commentator on Chinese politics, to ask you, Mr. Tahuni has just told us that before political movements destroy what is, they need a clear vision of what they want to replace it with. Is there a clear vision emerging in China of what a new politics might look like? It's a gradual process. It's very difficult to say there was a whole change. Mm -hmm. uh, I, am, I, am, I was uh, uh, the activist in the 1989. If you asked me at that time, it seemed that everything was clear, that we can borrow the whole form, political form of democracy from Western countries to China. But if you ask the people now, what kind of political form you want, I guess they still will say we need something. For example, the, the individual rights, the rule of law, and so on and so forth but not necessarily. We are asked to uh, transplant that the system into China, partly because certain kind of the success of the economic developments, and also not only for this, but the wiping up of the poverty, large, large scale deduction of the poverty. But on the other hand, we suffered from social inequality, corruption, and a certain kind of political control and so on and so forth. So it's a kind of very complicated issue. This is a, the phenomena. Second, I think, as I, I agree with that, that the uh, separation of political form and economic developments and, and actually the social form is a universal phenomenon. I found that, that the, uh, we, we, we can perceive, we can compare the different performance of political systems, like a Chinese po uh, political systems, Western democracy. Obviously, we saw there's a two kind of the political systems. Mm -hmm. However, if we considered what is the, what are the, the, the real social crisis, we found a lot of the similar, uh, similarities, social inequality, corruption and the detachment between the political system and the social form and the issue of minority, the conf these were the, the real problems with our society, but we, we also found these similar phenomena in other society, which means that the, these were, the, when we think about the, how to reform Chinese political systems, we need to take consideration of the reflection on the political system here, then we can find the new way but, to move forward. But in a word, what would a political form in China look like that follows the social form? Uh, for example, uh, obviously there were uh, different views in China. And uh, I think that uh, they started from the, uh, the problems, not uh, then we can see how to overcome that, uh, the difficulties. The first of all, I think that the decline, we're talking about the representative democracy. Both in the uh, representative democracy and the Chinese system, it's not the representative the democracy, one party system, but both were to different extent, mm -hmm. suffered from decline of re representation because political parties, their claim represent the people's interests, but actually, the gap between the ruling class or the, the party and the people were, it, it's, it's a huge gap there and in different levels, in different systems. In China, how to, for example, in Chinese system, Communist Party claimed that to be the representative of working class or the people. But if you perceive that the corruption, the scale of corruption, obviously there was a crisis of representation. Mm -hmm. It's, so that's why the people, when the social movements, they, on the one hand, they argue for the protection of the citizen rights, but on the other hand, they actually resort to some older slogans, mm -hmm. like uh, the redistribution on the slogan of socialism, to revive certain kind of the elements mm -hmm. in a way for the more democratic way. Mm -hmm. So this is the, 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 so it's not, uh, I don't think it's uh, very difficult to say that we can think about these things in a total level, it is a totality, mm -hmm. by trying to find some elements from within the system, how to revive something to overcome other. 
<laughs> as PACT. Thank you. And let me turn to you for a quick moment. How many of you think that politicians in your country are becoming more and more distant, more and more alien to the populations they're governing? So how many of you think the distance is getting greater? How many of you think that politicians are still close to the, those they're governing? Oh, that's a very strong, how many of you are Swiss? Ah. So we should point not a, out. Not a representative. We should point out that we sit here this evening in one of the homes of democracy. And I think we've just seen one of the effects of that. So, so thank you. Um, do you have any question at this point? Who, who came tonight with a burning question that you thought, I really want tonight's panel to answer the following question? Nobody. Okay. One person, good. I'm going to take one question before I move to the next panelist. Can we have the microphone to the man with the burning question? Uh, it's truly a burning question. Thank you very much. Um, Moritz Bondeli from the University of Lausanne. And I would like to ask, uh, how do you strike a balance between, on the one hand, you've mentioned it before, um, the rule of majority and on the other hand, uh, the protection of the minorities. That's really the question that, cons mm -hmm. that is burning. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. And I'm sure the panelists are going to give convincing answers. Um, I would like now to move to, I think you're, well, you're definitely the only mayor I've ever met who's been a heavyweight boxing champion. Um, Viktor Klitschko, the mayor of Kiev. Um, we're pleased to have you here with us. Mayor, let me cut to the chase. Will Ukraine be a democracy in five years' time? Yes. <laughs> a very... We will be European country. No, we European country. Uh, first of all, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here in panel and uh, say a couple of words. First of all, uh, uh, to give uh, answer for your question, yes, we will be European country because we European, Ukraine in Europe, geographically, Ukraine. We, we Ukrainian, with our history, with our mentality, we European. But we far away from Europe with uh, standards of life. Mm -hmm. And I'm more than sure the movement, what we're doing right now, is European movement. And we sign association agreement and uh, we uh, want to be a European country with European standards of life. It's first point. Can I, can I pick up one of those standards for you, Mayor? Some would say, and this I could put to all the panelists, that one of the cancers of democracy is corruption. Will, if, if Ukraine will be democratic in five years' time, do you think it will also be on path to be a society with less corruption? Yes. Uh, uh, Ukraine today is uh, famous, was famous as the most corrupt country in Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, to destroy corruption is main task for uh, present government, for the people, because people expect to change in Ukraine. Short story. Short story is usually a story for 20, uh, 250 around 250 million people who live in all part of Soviet Union. I born in Soviet Union. It's the best country in the world, I think, because every morning we think it's our country. It's the best country. It's the, our idea, socialism, is the best uh, idea in the world. We say just good for our government. We was very happy. We have less money, but uh, we live very poor. We don't know about that. People can live better. Uh, we truly believe is our country is the best in the world. Pestroika came, 
and saying sport, I have a chance to travel outside of the country because nobody had a chance to travel outside of of Soviet Union. Very uh, few people. I was shocked. My first visit was to United States, to Florida. I come back and then told to my father, what I see, it's, it's amazing, it's dream. My father was uh, uh, Air Force officer. He truly believed he was communist. He truly believed it's our system, it's our country, it's the best one. Told me, Vitaly, it's not true, especially they use you as ambassador, show you good part of country, and right now you explain to everybody the United States better than our country, or as Soviet Union. Okay, <laughs> the next my visit ex was exactly the same. I visited another country in Europe, capitalist country, and slowly I changed my opinion, I, I changed my uh, vision. 1991, Ukraine, uh, iron, uh, uh, iron Curtain fall down. And we, everybody, have a chance, we have a dream to build modern European uh, democratic country. In this time, our neighbors, Poland, <laughs> Slovak Republic, Czech Republic, starting to make a movement. For example, GDP in Poland was twice less than in Ukraine in the beginning of 90. Right now, GDP in Poland four times bigger than in Ukraine. They make a lot, a lot of changes because they take direction, European direction. And we listen so long time from uh, in our government. We make changes in our in Ukraine. Very uh, soon, life will be better. And in reality, corruption grown up. The, uh, some part of the people who still uh, big resources in country in very short period very sh uh, short period of time making billions mm -hmm. the rest of the country 99% of uh, population survive mm -hmm. we believe we support president yanukovych who promised to all country listen everyone and sign association agreement and to make our country european democratic modern country with that explanation, very short, in uh, uh, one and a half years ago in Vilnius, with that explanation, he doesn't cite association agreement, told to, I don't want. The whole country was ex uh, very, really disappointed because people still believe we getting better life. We will be a really democratic country, modern democratic country. Students, children, 17, 18, 19 years uh, old, make a demonstration. Yanukovych have great idea, send special police forces, beat bloody and badly students. Nobody expect. The next day, millions of people come into the street and say, we don't want to live in dictator. We don't want to live in uh, authoritarianism. We want to sign a session agreement. Please, Yanukovych, don't do that. And we call everybody revolution of dignity, Euromaidan, because main point, we want to be European country. But not everybody was happy f from this idea. Uh, also, our East neighbors uh, was not happy. Ukraine will be not part of new big empire like before. But we Ukrainians don't want to be back in USSR. We want to be modern, European, democratic country. It's. Uh, uh, Thank I you. Can, I, I'm yeah. gonna, that that was wonderful picture it's, of what you have lived through as a mayor. I'd, li I'd like to turn just in these introductory comments and please do wave your hands 
during any part of this discussion, when you have a burning question to put to our panelists, um, you are part of this conversation. Um, and in the absence of waving hands, okay, I've got two hands here, so I'm gonna take two quick questions from down here. Oh, uh, one. Mike. Ah, we've wrong-footed the microphones. Uh, Mr. Lichko, I have a burning question. The relationship now of war and democracy. We are living, of course, in a very difficult situation. Why we are sitting here is bombing Ukraine, East Ukraine. And we have great problem, even with the president who is here, also bombing um, the, same, the same people from Ukraine, the East Ukraine. My question is, is it possible in this time of war to have democracy? Because the war situation now is, is not possible to, to follow the democracy European idea. Though I, I'm here to hear your um, statement to find a political solution. If we only, I heard, on a military so-called solution, we will never have um, democracy. This is my question to you because it's a burning question for all the people that it comes not together, democracy and the, sit and the military situation. I know it's not one-sided, it's both sides, but we have to reflect this uh, context, democracy and the mm -hmm. actual situation. So is there a negotiated solution? Is there a negotiable solution? We uh, try everywhere to find the compromise, but it's not the question. We can find compromise regarding our independence, regarding our unity uh, of, uh, of Ukraine. It's democracy, uh, democratic movement. If president don't listen to the population, if president disappoint millions of people, don't support of which of the people live better and make money for himself and his family, everybody know about that. The people come to the street and kick out this president. We reloading whole system. We have new president who is elected by people. In first, first time in our history, in first round of president election, because majority of the people give uh, uh, give him support, we reloading whole system. Can you can you imagine so, uh, short pictures about Ukraine? The representative of party of Yanukovych doesn't have support in uh, capital of Ukraine. They cancelled um, uh, mayor election. Capital of Ukraine live three years without self-government, without mayor of Kyiv. We make mayor election, city council election, we make parliament election. It's democracy, open. Uh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to um, move now to the man on my left, now the Secretary General of the OECD, but for a long time a member of the Mexican government as finance minister and in other roles, in other cabinet roles, during a period in Mexico's history where Mexico undertook a gradual, I think it's fair to say, but my good friend Angel Gurria will correct me, um, where Mexico took, undertook an un, a, a gradual transformation from a one-party state, the PRI, of which he was a member, to permitting an open, contested, election, which resulted in the one party losing the election. So tonight we've heard from two revolutionaries wanting to get rid of governments, posing the question, what on earth will replace them? And already from one and now from another uh, speaker who can speak about a more gradual form of change. Do you think it worked, Dunhill, or do you wish, after all, that you'd been a revolutionary? Well, it didn't work because we lost. No. Uh, um, actually, I think, uh, like everything else, uh, this started in the 60s. More and more, the government introduced representation of the oppositions. And then there came a moment when, you know, they had a multiplication of parties, and you have party of the right, the left, etc. And uh, the traditional parties lost their footing. Um, 
in many parts because they were being questioned, they got things wrong, they didn't deliver, but also as an inevitable result of a more educated, much better informed society. You know, we are next door to the United States. And as a former president of Italy said, um, ah, she said, if only the, 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 the Italy had 100 kilometers of border with United States, we would be the most wonderful country in the world. And he said, yes, so would we, but we have 3,000 kilometers, and that, that's a little bit more complicated, no? But the, 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 the point is the following. It was, in a way, this is, you have all the information, you have all the education, uh, you have, uh, you know, a healthier, a more participatory. It was inevitable that there would be uh, uh, a, a, uh, a change. By the way, now that the government that lost the, 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 that election 12 years later, two six-year governments later, is back. Mm -hmm. So now there is alternates, really. Um, and uh, I would say, uh, from not only from my own experience, now I've been at the helm of the OECD now for nine years, and of course governance and government uh, is a, a critical element of what we do, uh, uh, looking at um, uh, and you, you're, you're, you're in, uh, in Oxford, you're about government, you know, you're the school of government uh, in, 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 uh, in Oxford. So I like to say, I think there's no end in democracy. Democracy is alive, kicking, progressing, uh, you know, and, and getting more and more countries. Uh, uh, now we are more than double the number of countries that can be, that can be described as fully democratic than we had in the 70s. And the number of autocracies, which used to be about 80 or something like that, now they're really, you can really, good autocracies, you know, well-functioning, well-defined autocracy, maybe 20, but, you know. So, democracy is making progress. What is uh, not happening at the same time is that because democracy is happening, and then people are actually becoming more demanding, and then they want to, transform the institutions, and what do we have now? What are the legacies of the crisis? Low growth, highest unemployment, since, you know, the, we always compare to the crisis of the 30s, it doesn't make any sense. This is the biggest crisis in our lifetime, period. So, so low growth, high unemployment, growing inequalities all over the place. And then what is the result? A massive erosion of trust. And trust in what? Well, in everything we built in 100 years, in presidents, in prime ministers, in ministers, in political parties, in, in multinationals, uh, in uh, you know, uh, uh, banking systems, in international organizations. All the institutions we built including the, the, the institutions around which our democratic system was built. And they are casting doubts on that because they're saying, this is not delivering for me. This democracy, this system is not delivering and is not providing solutions for my problem. They're not, they don't go cosmic and they don't get academic about it, it's my problem, you know, and it's not delivering. And this is why we have this loss of trust. In the OECD, which are the most developed countries in the world, we have less than 40%, or around 40% of the people don't, you know, are the only ones who have some kind of trust, the rest don't trust and the numbers are growing. So uh, you, you have a, a very serious problem because one should not confuse that because governments don't deliver, that it is democracy that is either wrong or that it, we are gonna finish with democracy. No, the question is, it is democracy that is generating the pressure, the demand, that there is transparency and that people deliver on the quality of the services. This is because it's democracy is there and now they have different ways of telling it, and ultimately, of course, you know, we'll meet in the next election, but people don't wait for the next election. They also 
they go to the NGOs, they go to television, they go to the media, and the freedom of the media is a result of democracy. It's not the other way around. You don't get democracy because you don't start with freedom of the media and then produce democracy. It is democracy that allows for, a, and then it kind of reinforces itself uh, as you go along. But this is what is happening. Uh, our governments have not delivered in what they were supposed to do, what they offered, which is ultimately more well-being, more welfare for the, the whole of the people, particularly for the most vulnerable. And therefore, don't confuse the questioning of the efficiency of governments and of the mandate of governments with democracy itself. Democracy, as Mr. Churchill uh, once famously said, is the worst of all forms of government except for all the others. So. <laughs> but let me, thank you, let, let me push you because are you saying that the problem is that politicians have overpromised? Politicians have said that they will deliver well-being and growth and they can't? Or are you saying that politicians, the politicians we've got are not competent enough to deliver economic growth? Both. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's some more. There's a question of the thresholds of tolerance. Mm -hmm. Why? Because, you know, you got highest ever unemployment numbers. Again, you know, Switzerland's a bit of an island, so it's not very typical. But uh, you are still, as we speak now, we're still destroying jobs, losing jobs in the euro area. The average is 11.5 in the euro area unemployment. And youth unemployment 23 and a half percent and still in some of the world's most important economies in Europe and democracies in Europe you have 50 percent youth unemployment so when you when you get this you know you imagine a young man who went to university has his diploma uh, and can't find a job for two or three years he has been in unemployment benefits he lost them now because it's it that expires and he reads that the richest individuals in this country don't pay taxes because they have put their money in some tax haven. But then that the biggest companies in this country don't pay taxes mm -hmm. because they are multinationals and they go to uh, tax havens also and they have all sorts of patent boxes and this and this and that and they don't pay taxes. Um, and then uh, they are getting lousy quality of delivery of services. Um, and then also, uh, they suddenly find that not only uh, do the rich and uh, the multinationals and uh, they don't get good services, and, but they also they find that there's corruption. And that uh, the, the, the procurement systems are wrong and that uh, there's conflict of interest, there's lobbying, there's revolving doors, etc. And he is there, you know, and he is saying, you know, what am I doing here? And then the frustration turns into bubbling anger and then you got people out in the streets expressing their anger in sometimes extremely, extremely destructive, clearly socially unacceptable ways. But again, you know, uh, it's, it's something that was created by the fact that, you know, democracy made it possible for the expression to happen, but then it comes when the, the fringes, the abuses, etc., when people, you know, use their, their freedom uh, under democracy in order to express sometimes a, in undesirable fashion. But again, these and, are and the messages. Hold on, what should a democracy, in your view, do when the freedom of speech is used to insult a minority? I think there should be uh, a, a very clearly uh, balances. Uh, one cannot you, you mean use censorship a, or oh no i think you should you should uh, equilibria let's say one cannot use or extend the freedom of one individual or group of individuals to an extent when it uh, steamrolls the rights of others there there has to be this is what society is about about balancing about equilibria and fundamentally about the respects of others the question is that has to be number one very carefully written, number two, very carefully practiced, and number three, it is one of the greatest tests with globalization, with migrations, and with 
societies which are aging and which need migration and therefore diversity in order to continue to function and to grow. Clearly, there has to be an element of tolerance which has been absent in many cases. And it is very dramatic that today in the 21st century, we are seeing these examples of intolerance on many countries and many sides. Uh, the world today is not a, a very a fine place, but again, don't blame democracies. These are the faults, the flaws, or the rules, the regulation, the practices, and of course, our education systems, are we teaching the right things, the values, the tolerance, which are the fundamentals for a functional society. Let me just pick up and ask the audience. You just heard an eloquent argument for a balancing, I think, is the diplomatic language used by the Secretary General, but a curtailment of freedom of speech when it's used to insult a minority. How many of you think that freedom of speech should include the freedom to insult a minority, if we put it in that language? How many of you believe that? Okay, and how many of you reject that view? Oh, very, very interesting. So for those of you that can't see, there's quite a, a, a much larger number that, that take the opposite view. Um, I'm going to now move to um, the governor of Colorado, because one of the things that Angel Gurria has put to us is that governments are failing to deliver. He said, Partly it's politicians over-promising, but it's partly a lack of competence on their part. As an aside, let me say, as Dean of Oxford University School of Government, we're doing our best on the competence side to, to, to educate a new generation of leaders. But Governor, on one issue that democracy gets a lot of criticism, the, the short-termism of democracy, the failure to deal with long-term issues like climate change. You've actually led interesting initiatives and in change in Colorado. What's made that possible? Well, and before I say that, the, the question about how do we protect the rights of minorities, mm -hmm. I think other, in that context, we lost the notion that it's not just democracy, right? Democracy has to be built on a platform of the rights of private property, rule by law, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, all, all that is part and parcel. And I think that's what protects the minorities when you, uh, when you get into a, a, a good, constructive democracy. Uh, what we've tried to do in Colorado, and Colorado is unusual in that we are as partisan as the United States has become, we're almost equally one-third Republican, one-third Democrat, and one-third Independent. And in a funny way, that allows us to go out, even as the, the new media demands instant answers. They, they want leaders that say, yes, here's we're going to do this. Whereas good democracy is more nuanced. It requires a thoughtful discussion and allowing both minorities and majority opinions to be heard and, 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 and discussed. So when we look at uh, hydrocarbon exploration in Colorado it has a great deal of natural uh, of natural gas, great deal of oil, uh, and yet a lot of people there, it's very beautiful, not unlike Switzerland, lovely mountains and beautiful clean air and water. So we had to balance that, and we spent a great deal of time trying to make sure that we had the representatives of the oil and gas industry in the same room as the representatives of uh, climate change, the, all the nonprofits, the NGOs that were arguing for the people's rights. And in essence, metaphysically, we kind of locked the doors and they spent the first three or four months just arguing over the definition of terms and, and different scientific papers. But after a certain point in that discussion, that relationship, they began to get to compromises. And we were the first state to actually have an integrated set of regulations around methane and, and natural gas emissions when you're exploring for oil and gas that people thought we could never get to. But it really was a, a process of, of listening. I mean, one of my cabinets said that the, the single best way to change someone's mind on any issue is to listen harder and to get them to repeat again and again why they are so against one thing or another. Uh, too often now, we end up with a, a vetocracy. I can't remember who said that, but you know, the constituencies, all the special interest group band together and they will really 
can block almost any uh, effort around progress, and that's part of the, the challenge. The only way you can really just kind of diffuse that is to get people in the same room to listen. We're, you know, water is precious in Colorado, in all of the American West, like most of the world, and we're now trying to make a statewide water plan that we will integrate with the other water plans of Western states. And part of that, again, is, is building those relationships, having over several years, making sure, I mean, democracy is dependent upon empathy. If you can't put yourself in the shoes of someone else, and if, you're, if, you're, if the people of your state or your government can't do that, it'll never succeed. But that comes more naturally through a long term of discussion and building those. First, it's an acquaintance, then it's a relationship, and then you get to trust and, and transactions. So I think that's one thing that we've, I mean, the, the big argument in the US is one side says government should be bigger, do more. One says government should be smaller, do less. The real issue is government has to work. Whatever it does, it has to do it efficiently and effectively uh, in a transparent fashion. It has to do it elega elegantly. There has to be some customer ser service. So we've tried to change the discussion to how do we make government work? And we're not going to worry quite as intensely about more taxes or less taxes. You know, I Professor, uh, Wang mentioned that politics needs to reflect in some way the society over which it's governing. And um, when we look at the United States, those of us that watch Fox News, CNBC, etc., what we see is a really startling polarization oh, yeah. of American political debate, um, with, which, which seems terribly extreme, I think it's fair to say, for most Europeans. Um, is that reflecting a society which is becoming more extreme or is it driving a society to extremes and does that make government more difficult? Well, it's both. I, I think part of this is what Angel was talking about, the, the shrinking of the middle class, the number of people that have been out of work for over six months. I mean, and I was, when I was, many years ago, was out of work for uh, almost two years and it changes how, how, you, how you relate to your friends and your family, what you see in the mirror. Uh, and many, many people are going through that. You tie that in with the bitterness of the partisanship so that, I mean, attack ads, and they're spreading slowly but surely around the world. But, you know, the United States, we, we invented jazz. We invented a, a, a number of great art forms, but we unfortunately have invented this, this form of marketing in politics called the attack ad, which is just ruthlessly, insidiously, uh, it, it diminishes people Mm -hmm. Incredibly. And I, you know, I just went through a difficult re-election and made the, some said, foolhardy promise that we would not do any attack ads. Mm -hmm. and I think I was perhaps the only contested statewide race that, that did that, and we, we won, but very narrowly. And you never see it in business. You know, Mutar Kent and I were talking in Davos two years ago, and, you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi are, let's just say they're rather competitive. <laughs> well, you never see Coca-Cola doing an attack ad against Pepsi, because Attack ads and, and, and creating that anger works. Mm -hmm. If you, they did the attack ad, Pepsi's sales would go down. Pepsi would have no choice but to do an attack ad against Coke. Mm -hmm. Coke sales would go down, Coke would attack Pepsi, Pepsi would attack Coke. You would diminish sales in the entire product category of soft drinks. Mm -hmm. What we're doing with these attack ads is we're diminishing the product category of democracy. And people turn off the news, they uh, stop reading policy magazines or reading in depth about the issues, and we accept that at our own peril. And especially with young people, you see them, they want to get just the, the headlines and, and, and too often will not go into the depth needed to really understand these issues. Is there a lesson there for other democracies around the world? I mean, until the 1980s, the United States had regulation on its media, right? Fair comment or whatever it was, yep. fair argument. If you were going to present one extreme view, you actually had to present what the other side of that view looked like. And it seemed to me that deregulating that opened up this extraordinarily polarized debate. Would, would, is it too late to put the genie in the box, back in the box in the United States? Would you draw lessons from that for other democracies? Well, certainly, I, I think it probably is too late in the United States. The, the freedom of, of speech has now been embraced uh, at that level. Uh, and the, uh, <laughs> thank you. 
the Food service organization. I tell you, that's why the United States and Mexico has such a strong relationship. And, <laughs> and we're going to build a stronger. Actually, next fall, we're going to have the first summit of all the governors of Mexico, all the governors of the United States, and all the premiers of Canada to begin having these same kinds of discussions. Um, but anyway, I think that the, it's like trying to define what is fair and what's not. Mm -hmm. We have been working on trying to create nonpartisan uh, 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 committees that, that might look at mm -hmm. attack ads and say, all right, we can't stop them, right? That's a freedom of speech issue, mm -hmm. but we can give the person who's being attacked a significant amount of money to, to run an ad and defend him, him or herself against those attacks. Mm -hmm. So there, there are several different possibilities to defend against it, but clearly it's not healthy. After the election, no matter who wins, if you have that nasty an election, mm -hmm. it's hard for the people to come together I mean, democracy is supposed to, after the, after the heat and battle of the election, everyone should come together, put aside their differences, and work for the common good. And we've moved further and further away from that over the last 25 or 30 years. I have something to add. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. So, Chattahoui. So let's see what, what I'm listening to tonight. Hmm. Uh, I'm listening to a system that is polarized. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to a system that doesn't have a lot of protection for minorities. I'm listening to a system that doesn't have uh, a lot of uh, uh, inclusiveness in terms of economic growth. And here I am, an advocate of democracy in that part of the world. And I think that's a very hard system to defend or take with me back to Libya. Uh, uh, I, think, I think that's a very important point. Mm. And my point here is, uh, when you look at democracy, it's not really the goal is democracy. It's the goal what democracy delivers. Mm -hmm. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, if, we, if we are looking into these emerging, if we're looking at something that is mature, such as the United States and Europe, and look over more than 200, 300 years, and we're still struggling, and I agree with Churchill when he said that's maybe not the perfect system, but that's the best that, that we have. But then you realize the challenge of transferring this experience to other parts of the world, uh, be it Russia, or be it Ukraine, or be it the Middle East, for example. So and what we're talking about is we're looking into a, a process where people participate, but we are emphasizing only the part whereby the political participation. In Libya, we had four elections after the revolution. So if, if we define democracy as elections, we are in our way uh, uh, into a democratic system. And we are further, we're not even close to the beginning of that mm. process. And what for you is the, f the first necessary step towards democracy in uh, Libya? I, I, think, I think that uh, economic growth uh, maybe it's my training as an economist, <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, if you really don't have inclusiveness in terms of the economic opportunity, it's very hard to defend any economic system. I'm, uh, I'm a strong advocate of democracy, and part of the reason is I can't really figure out a better system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and not only a better system, I think what we have here, it's the cost of the failure of the democratic process. I, in many ways, you can say that they are still very low because nothing emerged so far uh, that, that uh, uh, can beat with democracy. But uh, to answer your question directly, I think what I came from, I think the idea is that we lived for so long in that part of the world, and it's our fight, by the way. There is a lot of uh, intellectuals in the Middle East who basically say that our problem is the West or imperialism or, I think it's an indigenous problem. There is a revolution that happened five years ago in Europe, and that revolution destroyed an economic system, replace it with, that's the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. and democracy came as a legitimate, le, to legitimize that economic revolution. Nothing like that happened in our region. And because of that, we still in many ways are destroying what exists which should be destroyed, mm -hmm. but we haven't really brought about the alternative. And I think the key part of the alternative is not just the inc inclusiveness, the political process, mm -hmm. but we have to find an, a, a sustainable economic 
uh, a model that, especially for the youth, for women, I think that's the most important uh, uh, aspect of uh, bringing this democracy in reality to that part of the world. And are there any things that the rest of the world, you know, people in this room from many parts of the world, are there things that the rest of the world can do to help Libya become a democracy, or is the most important thing that they should do to stay out? I, I think, uh, I think both. Um, <laughs> that this, yeah. No, I, you know, for example, we, we, I, I'm in charge of writing a, a constitution to Libya. And it's very hard to write a constitution at any time, let alone you writing a constitution during a war. And that's the question earlier I asked about uh, democracy and, and, and you know, when you are in a war. Literally, the place that we meet uh, almost every three, four days, a car, a bomb car will explode next to it. So on one hand, you could say that this is a, a kind of a losing enterprise. Uh, this is kind of a celebration of stability, if you like. We can't, you know, we can't do that. And, uh, but on the other hand, I'm a strong believer um, that, uh, that, that, that you need, uh, 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 that, that the old regimes uh, are done with, and we need to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not the idealism, but I'm a strong believer in democracy. I'm a strong believer in, and maybe we can find uh, a better way of, of, of institutionalizing uh, uh, these economic uh, minorities, all of these issues in the constitutions. Mm -hmm. uh, the West can help, and they are helping in terms of technical assistance, in terms of the, the, the EU, the United Nations. Mm -hmm. But by and large, I, I, I think what is happening in the Middle East, it's our problems. It, we have to face it. We haven't really faced that problem seriously over generations. And I think <clears throat> at the end of the day, the rest of the world can help. But the people who really, like in Libya, we're fighting, uh, we're fighting terrorism. Mm -hmm. We're fighting this mm -hmm. radicalism, mm -hmm. literally fighting them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think at the end of the day, that's what needs to be done. Uh, and the West can, can cheer or can help. Great. I want to come to you now for your more of your questions for our panelists. Could we, uh, sorry, where is the microphone? Yeah, if we can bring it up to here. Do tell us who you are, by the way, just very briefly. Hi, I'm Jasmine, I'm a student. And my question is, well, you've been talking a lot about um, how government's meant to be effective and how perhaps politicians have underperformed. But at the same time, you're also talking about the electorate that has a very short attention span and will only consume very well, heated debates. So I wanted to ask you, from what I've been reading on the discussion about importing democracy in China, um, there are a lot of people who hold the opinion that the quality of the electorate or the quality of the political dis uh, discussion, the suzhi, is really important for democracy to work. Uh, what do you think about, well, for you personally, do you think that it's not only the politicians who contribute to how democracy whether it functions, or to what extent is um, the quality of the electorate important, and then to what extent is the quality of the electorate um, dependent upon uh, inequality, socioeconomic inequality? Thank you. Hmm. Any, any thoughts on this? I mean, one part of that question, if we put it more, even more sharply to the politicians on our panel, is, you know, are politicians failing to frame democracy and frame issues, give their societies a narrative which they can understand and join forces on. You know, th some of tonight's discussion has been about the way in which in every one of your countries there has been a polarization and a splitting, whether it's led to war in Ukraine or very divisive politics in the United States or, you know, tribal split in, in Libya. And surely a political process has to sit above that. Incredibly difficult job, but it has to sit above that and offer people a chance to negotiate across their differences. But for people to believe that, don't politicians have to lead? Don't politicians have to frame the issue in that way, like give us the narrative? John? You know, one, two things, and the other part of the question, the quality of the electorate which I th don't think can be underestimated. It's why almost, I mean, every country in the world is working so hard on education. 
But I think the... the, the but sorry, I, 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 frame, I reframe the question because so many politicians say it's not our problem, it's the quality of the electorate. <laughs> which I, no, so I'm, exactly I'm right. clicking it back and saying, well, politicians actually frame some of the quality of the electorate. Well, and the electorate is, is receiving or what they feel the politicians create, which oftentimes is the politicians create a small amount of hero and, and other at events create a large amount. And the, the electorate also, I think politicians are sometimes held hostage when I actually, when I had, a, I used to own a restaurant, a large restaurant, and we used to give every, twice a year we'd give our employees a bonus, in summer and not in the winter holidays, and we were very successful. And then we had a recession a couple of years and we couldn't give them that bonus. Well, you would have thought we had taken their children. It was, it, it was their right, they'd been given it, and I think that, you know, how we frame questions, you know, the, the politicians, that, that we can, we make try to convince people that we can deliver many things that often are, are very difficult to get. I, again, we all can talk about income inequality or inclusivity within democracy, but the, the actual solutions are challenging, and, and especially to find solutions that, that the electorate believes in. And I don't disagree, the, the, the politicians are, could certainly be doing a better job, mm -hmm. but th there's no shortage of people trying to figure out the solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, add something. For example, you know that uh, in China there was an experiment for the election in the local, like in a village level and a township. So those people, were, most of them were the peasants. They were capable to vote. So a, a scholar, he made a joke, he working on this, compared the performance of the, uh, for example, in the university, the professors. Not necessarily, their performance for the election were better than the peasants. Partly because you know that the peasants, when the redistribution of land or redistribution of something, they know where is their real interests. Mm -hmm. So they follow that logic. And then to another level, it's, so in that sense, education is important. But on the other hand, the suju, if you talk about the quality, then I think it's really, to some extent, in conflict in that level, because a lot of, in, in China, is a, a lot of the experiments in this level, the peasants can do that. The, the question is that it's not about their suju, the quality. It's about the, uh, for example, the people who have the, the money, who can manipulate mm -hmm. behind a door and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Or when we talk about the freedom of, of the speech, that's good. However, when we talk about the freedom of media, sometimes misleading too, because media could be manipulated, mm -hmm. could be in terms of, like Habermas said, uh, refutalized. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. That also happened in, the, in different levels, in like a village level or in other levels. So this is the, uh, uh, so we, in that sense, I think when we talk about the democracy, why I, uh, sometimes I feel it's difficult to answer the question as a whole, mm -hmm. the end of democracy or the, 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 the future of democracy. Democracy is, is there as a value, were well, very positive for us. Mm -hmm. However, we need to reflect the historical condition, mm -hmm. why in many cases the democracy didn't work. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, when we talk, think about the political reform in China, we should we think about that, and as this is the one. Second, when we talk about the democracy, sometimes, because it's a modern invention for us, how sometimes when we only fo focus on that, which prevent us to think about the elements from our tradition, to modernize that certain kind of the tradition, could be a kind of the elements in a modern form. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's workable or the function. So this is the, uh, the, the election or the recommendation or something else together for big possibilities. I think this is the uh, how can realize that. Great. So that's why uh, for me, sometimes the over normative answer to this question is very difficult to answer mm -hmm. because all these political practices was happened in a very concrete mm -hmm. historic condition. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a strong yeah. message here that yeah. Democracy has to be homegrown. Yes. And I think mm -hmm. it's probably something that every one of the panelists seem to be saying 
You're going to disagree. Uh, well, no. The, the question is that this this is a, a fundamental question, but it is it's almost I would say electorates are the ones who drive the quality of their leaders. More educated, better informed electorates, more engaged electorates. This is I say this because engagement and sense of commitment with the process is absolutely critical. People who disengage because they feel, you know, they're not gonna make a difference, they have nothing to say, et cetera, deserve what they get, huh? But if you get engaged and you're better informed, then leaders will be increasingly better in the sense of transparency and sense of the quality of the things they deliver, the quality of the decisions, et cetera, because they are more and more scrutinized. Again, this is about you know, there's not one democracy, there's, there's evolving levels of democracy, there's the depth, the breadth, the quality of democracies. There's some democracies that are more mature than others. But on how... But there, the, the more it evolves, mm -hmm. the more the electorate will dictate and will demand and will produce. But surely, Better authorities. But surely politicians frame the issues for the electorate. When the United States announced the war on drugs as an approach to addiction problems within the United States, a policy which deeply affected Mexico, Colombia, and all other countries in the region, it framed the issue for an electorate. The United States has an incredibly educated electorate. But nevertheless, that framing opened the door to a very particular set of policies. Shouldn't politicians take responsibility for that? I mean, it's not the education of the electorate. Absolutely, and uh, eventually, you know, uh, you will have also the same electorate will know whether it works or not. That's the ultimate question. Mm -hmm. And that is, if you elect somebody and he says, let's go this way with healthcare, and you know, you support them, you trust them, he has the votes, he can deliver, well, then you fix the problems that arise around the edges, the computer problems, the glitches, et cetera. But if you have half of the electorate saying, the government should not be telling me whether I should go or not go, or whether I have the right or not the right, you know, I can do whatever I want with my health, with my life. If you have a, a, a large part of the electorate talk about polarization, that says that they don't need a single core uh, 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 syllabus for mathematics. So you had, you know, every state had a different one and the results, of course, the United States came out average on the PISA tests when they spent three times more money than say Slovakia per student and they came out just the same level of Slovakia, okay? So it's... I think Switzerland came out quite well. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, uh, President Obama called it a Sputnik moment. The Secretary of Education of the United States, Mr. Duncan, called it a wake-up call. Why? Because you know, eventually things happen or not. So people have, but you're right. And, 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 and Neri is, is suggesting that eventually when you elect somebody, they are going to lead and then you follow but then you have to measure the consequences of the results. And if you don't like them, of course, you'll vote them out or you vote for somebody else next time. Vote is the ultimate instrument, but as I say, people don't have to wait until the next election. They have many other ways in a democracy to express themselves and to express the fact that they don't agree with what's going on day to day. Thank you. More questions, there were several more questions here. Yes, lady in the white scarf. Hello, my name is Tatiana, I'm a student. You were talking a lot about empathy and about a gap between what people need and what politicians uh, think that people need. So taking into account that the ultimate feedback, the election, happens only once in several years, what would you suggest politicians to do in order not to lose this connection with people and what you are personally doing? Mayor Klitschko. <coughs> people have expectation. People, um, uh, people have uh, need uh, feeling. They have influence in uh, politics. 
they have influence in uh, in movement in the country. Uh, if politician doesn't uh, implement wishes of the people, they will be re-elected. It's simple. Uh, re uh, I come back to my speech. Uh, I remember Soviet time. We have to think exactly the same. No freedom, no uh, rights, uh, no uh, freedom of press, freedom of opinion. In Soviet Union, you have to think exactly the same, like Politburo, like Communist Party. If you have different opinion, you have big chance to landing in prison. Exactly the same, come back to my speech regarding uh, uh, ex-president of Ukraine Yanukovych. He promised to listen in election, promised to listen everyone. He promised to sign the association agreement. They don't deliver uh, the promising. People was really upset. And we have new president. We have new politician who will be implement the wishes of the people. If they don't do that, we'll be immediately re-elected. Thank you very much. I'm going to take two more questions. I had one down here. Yes. Anita Farni from Switzerland and from the States. Uh, Mayor Klitschko answered a bit of my question now. I agree that one should try to encourage people to become engaged. Mm -hmm. That's very easy to say in a from a country that's already a democracy. How do you encourage people who risk their lives or encourage them to risk their lives um, in becoming engaged, which is the case, as Mr. Klitschko said, in many countries? Yeah. Terrific question, thank you. Could you pass the microphone to the gentleman to your right? Yes, hi, I'm Peter Neiman. I actually work as a medical doctor, um, both from Germany as well as the US. In my interactions with patients, um, especially the younger ones, I, I have encountered more and more a desire for transparency, more and more a desire for interactions. And I feel really that the digital age with the smartphones, internet has really changed how, how we approach things. We interact more, we communicate more. And it seems like that um, most people want to participate in democracies. And it seems that the best way for that to happen would be to have simply what we have here in Switzerland, more direct democracy, more elections, not just elections every three years, five years, six years, but maybe once a month. And if that's really the answer, and I'm not talking about electing a new parliament, I'm just talking about a say on immigration, a say on the budget, many things. If, um, if the answer is direct democracy, why? aren't we engaging that? So is the answer direct democracy? And if it is, why aren't we implementing it more? Thank you. Thank you very much. There was another couple of questions just in this. This is clearly a, a fertile corner. Um, yes, you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a student from Shanghai Tonghai University, China. And uh, I have a question, actually, uh, is a little bit different because uh, I'm thinking about the, the, the democracy on a, on a planetary scale, especially on a, you know, the global scale, different to the uh, democracy on uh, the national scale, because uh, it, it's something about the election of the ruling organi organizations and the ruling parties. And I know the OECD is one of the world leading organizations, so I want to know the, the, exactly the difference of the democracy of the world scale and the uh, democracy of the national scale. Great, Thanks. we're going up in ambition. I don't believe that everybody at the back doesn't have questions. So, uh, yes, there's, there's a question right there. Thank you. I'm a, an economics student, and as a Swiss, I'm gifted with the right to vote, a right that many other people in other countries have to fight for with their life. But when I look around the people in this country, especially at my peers, over half of them do not take advantage of that right. They don't vote. How would you address them and encourage them to participate again? 
Right. I, I won't embarrass you now by asking how many of you didn't vote, um, especially since you were all so keen on democracy. But um, back of the room, yes, there, a hand at the back. Oh, and, and sorry, why don't we take this gentleman and then the question at the back. Then I'm going to come back to our panelists. And our panelists, before we close, are each going to give you one idea on how we can strengthen democracy. Just one idea each. Yes, sir. Ja, meine Damen und Herren, ich bedanke mich für die Einladung. Ich bin Architekt. I would like to thank you for the uh, invitation. I'm an architect, uh, and uh, I don't have a question, but I have expectations. I expect uh, uh, a lot of things because I think that in this world we should lead and govern our economies uh, democratically. We should. Uh, uh, take everybody's interest into account uh, also uh, take into account uh, the uh, rights of minorities in order to be democratic on the other hand i think that a democracy will have to be led democratically as well in other words we have to make sure that we can afford what we want and wish for and sometimes it means that we have to renounce to something because we simply don't have enough money in order to fulfill your wishes important point about how we balance democratic governance <coughs> and equality with the hard trade-offs that politicians have to make. Last question at the back. We saw, we've been seeing a lot of revolutions in the Middle East that were democratic res revolutions, but it seems now that they're on hold and things have become very violent. And I just wanted to know where the panelists think they're eventually going to be heading. Is this going to eventually turn into democracy? I hope so, but uh, it doesn't seem like it's headed in that direction right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm going to just come to each panelist. Anhel, actually, on that last question, you were very optimistic about democratization, but lots of countries have gone backwards. They've had military coups. And some would say that there's no linear path to democracy. We all clap when a country has an election, but some countries steer straight into a sort of stagnant gray zone where they don't keep democratizing um, and nor do they get better government. So should we pause before we're as optimistic as you suggested we should be, Angel, about democratization? You know, what's, what's the one step What's the one proposal that you would have us pay attention to, to strengthen democracy? First of all, uh, be aware, be convinced, and uh, act accordingly. This is the only way. Uh, and second, uh, in the end, it's about individuals, it's about the citizen, it's about the citizens. Do they feel? better off. The ultimate mandate, regardless of the level of development, regardless of the level of wealth, is am I better off, is uh, the system. And that system is democracy at large, but it's also you know, the, the election system, it's also my civic engagement, it's also the level of information, uh, the, the capacity I have to, to participate, etc. Is it providing me uh, for a better uh, level of well-being, uh, and uh, I think this is the the ultimate question. This is in the most intimate uh, decision, the most intimate concern. Uh, you ask yourself that question. So I would uh, just uh, you know just just make people focus on that because the external consequences or the transparency of elections and things like that all are instruments. They're all tools. Mm -hmm. In the end, it's about getting people, you know, being uh, to be to be better off. And just very uh, fast, universal against local democracy. Frankly, I think it's a false dilemma. Uh, universal means you accept the concept that not consensus, not unanimity, but that a majority will allow things to happen. But that the people who also expressed their will, if they are outvoted and outnumbered, will accommodate the decision of the majority. As long as you do not have 
a roll, you know, steamrolling of those rights of the minorities. That means this is where those checks and balances in a democratic system come, come in. And last but not least, the quality of a democracy is filled with checks and balances. Probably the more mature, the better practicing democracies, they are more filled with some rules, some regulations, some codes uh, that one must observe because those are the ones that limit the capacity, the theoretical capacity of everyone to just take their own wishes to the ultimate consequence. Uh, those are the rules, those are the laws, this is what you know, uh, elected officials do, this is what, uh, um, this is what uh, 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 legislations or uh, uh, congresses do, parliaments do. So, uh, as I say, in the end, it's, what was it, uh, Tip O'Neill who said, all politics is local. I think in the end, um, it's true about democracy too. Um, there are democracies, not one democracy. Thank you. Governor Hickenlooper, um, Anna from Switzerland said, you know, half her peers don't bother voting. Same is true in the United States. Would you require people to vote? Would that strengthen democracy? You could require people to vote, but I don't think that's the solution. I agree to the problem. Uh, and I think the challenge is to get people to believe, uh, to believe in their institutions, to believe in their local government first, eventually their, their larger government. Uh, I think the, uh, the real challenge of, of, of rekindling belief, because there are so many ways to turn it off, is to focus, A, the traditional media, television, newspapers, to, to make sure that they see there's, uh, they have a self-interest in making sure that not every idea, not every individual is vilified, that, that, that actually finding, you know, positive stories and, and uh, some optimism helps people believe in, in, in a future. Uh, but I think especially social media is, is a great, so many young people don't vote in, in so many democracies, the people that have the most to gain by the democratic process are, show, have the least percentage of their, of their citizens voting. And I think social media can be a vehicle by which, you know, and it's not just Facebook or, or, or Instagram, but all the very varieties of social media can really be a catalyst for, again, not just young people, but all manner of citizens to begin to be engaged, to begin to believe, and ultimately I think that that belief and that engagement will result in, in more people voting. We, you know, this last off-year election, we had almost two-thirds people in Colorado voted, and we worked very hard on social media to make sure that everyone kind of understood the key issues, how important jobs were. This is a, all about a, a war on to get more jobs for more people in Colorado. Uh, and both, almost all the candidates were arguing different sides of that, but, but social media had a big part of that, of getting more people to vote. Mm. Of course, the problem with social media as a way of engagement is that it doesn't do the other bit that Governor Hickenlooper reminded us, the listening hard bit. <laughs> and there is no substitute for bringing people together. Um, we're running quickly out of time, but Governor Klitschko, I did want to put to you um, this problem of how you reach the whole of your population. Clearly, you have strong supporters in Ukraine, but there are also Ukrainians who are taking up arms against your political movement. How do you reach out to all of them? I'm sorry, I don't understand your question exactly. Can you repeat, please? She, she already made you a governor, so I think you're okay. Uh, sorry, she, sorry, she, Mayor. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I apologize, Mayor Klitschko, absolutely. So I just wondered, the challenge, surely, for a national Ukrainian politician is how to speak to all Ukrainians including those who are taking up arms against the government. How do you even begin? It's, for, uh, it's very important. Uh, I talk to, it's very important for every politician never lose the contact, connection to the people. If you lose connection, you don't have a future. It's very important to understand what people expect. Um, today's world is very small. Uh, we everybody receives so much uh, huge uh, so much information from media, uh, internet, uh, television, radio, uh, from everywhere. It's very important to uh, realize, to understand in which world you live, which you values, 
what you want in life, uh, which position have you country, you city, you building, you family. Uh, regarding Ukraine, it's very important for everyone. It's a uh, woman uh, give a question how people was motivated to risk his life mm -hmm. for values. They fighting for his values. They fighting for vision. They fighting for dream for new country. Because they have good example is work around the world, but the people politician line is nothing happens. They see the huge difference. Somebody explain about um, uh, uh, country, about problems, and at the same time buy, uh, make a competition between uh, politician. Which plane they buy, how many millions and how far the uh, plane uh, fly, the boat, how, uh, how, be, uh, how uh, many meters, and uh, how expensive the cars. And the people <coughs> see that and understand the country developed in the wrong direction. And that's why they mm -hmm. truly believe we have to make changes. Mm -hmm. We have influence. And if you don't believe yourself, you can, uh, you have an influence in your country and uh, your city. Nothing changed in your, uh, in your life. And regarding myself, I know maybe better than anyone, no fight, no win. And you have to fight in your life for your vision, for your dream, for your values. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Tahuni, the questioner at the back asked, are any of the Middle East revolutions going to lead to democracy? So outside of Libya, where are you most hopeful that one of the countries of the Arab Spring will end up more democratic? Is there any one country that you're optimistic about? Uh, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about uh, Tunisia. Mm -hmm. They are already in the process. I'm mm -hmm. optimistic about uh, uh, also Egypt to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very hopeful even for Libya today. Mm -hmm. The same thing, L Libyan are mm -hmm. killing uh, Libyans wholesale, same thing that happened in Ukraine. Uh, but I just want to end with this note. Uh, I think idealism is greatly discounted. Mm -hmm. I think it's great to dream uh, and to take a stand about what is right and what is wrong. And sometimes we make uh, 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 we make it make it very complicated defining what is right and what is wrong. I think right is very simple. Right is living to live in dignity, right, is to live in peace, right, and when we take, uh, take care uh, for the weakest among us, uh, I think uh, right uh, is uh, to, uh, again, uh, uh, make sure that your neighbor is as good as you are. What is wrong? Everything is against that is wrong. Mm -hmm. I think, for, especially for the young people, I want you to embrace uh, the idea of fighting for what is right. Now, in the case of Libya, uh, you know, I fought for 40 years to bring democracy. I'm a strong proponent of democracy. Still am, even with my comments about what I've, what I've observed today and what I've observed living in the United States. But I, I want you also to embrace the idea that democracy comes from different forms. Democracy have different ways of expressing itself. And at the end of the day, as I said earlier, it's not really democracy, it's what democracy delivers that we should really concentrate on zero one. Thank you very much. Professor Wang, did you want to add anything at all? We're just out of time. Last sentence. First of all, in China, I think top issues that we need the voice for the lower social strata in our public space. That was because we are the, the, the world factory. Now we had 300 million people working in this. Their condition was really poor. So in that sense, I think this is a very important thing. Second, these kind of the struggle, together with the experiment, I think the experiment is very important here and there. Not simply say that 
uh, only uh, radical change stirred the uh, social instability. But st on the one hand, you have needed the social struggle. But on the other hand, you need the uh, different kind of experiments for develop more open society, uh, the, the, uh, democratic society, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think tonight's panel has highlighted for every one of us a sort of checklist, some things we should think about when we adjudicate our own democracy and democracy in other countries. For me, those things include, from what we've heard, is the democracy we're looking at, does it build on a country's own traditions? Do people recognize it as their own democracy? Is freedom of speech balanced with the protection of minorities, which doesn't mean censorship. It means are there social forces that balance the effects of freedom of speech to keep a community together to the extent it can be? Is democracy causing people to listen hard? I, I won't forget Governor Hickenlooper's statement that the best way to persuade across communities is to listen even harder. Is democracy permitting that? Or is it yelling loudly from one group to the other group? And then about the politicians, three tests. Are the politicians over-promising on what they can actually deliver? Second, are they actually delivering what they can and should deliver? And third, are they, putting, are they creating a narrative which brings everyone in a society together? Are they creating a narrative which makes all people that they govern feel included? Or are they creating in their responses, whether it's to terrorist attacks or to drugs or to whatever, are they creating a narrative which splits their society into subgroups? That's a pretty rich test uh, or set of tests that our panelists have given us. I'll take it back to the school of government I had to think hard about how what we do um, can do that, and I hope that you'll all take that back to think about your democracies and how you can strengthen them. But can you join me in thanking wonderful panelists, Professor Hung Wang Hui, Mr. Ali Tahuni, President of the Libyan Consti Constitutional Assembly, Victor Klitschko, Mayor of Kiev, Governor Hickenlooper from Colorado, and Angel Guria, Secretary General of the United Nations. A huge hand for them.